Hey world, Dan Brown here with a very special episode on the Pogo Bat Gaming channel of a new series I'm calling Top 99. It's the Top 99 cards that are new cards, not reprints, from Guilds of Ravnica for the Commander format, Elder Dragon Highlander, through that lens. We got 99 to get through, so I don't want to waste any time at all. Number 99, we have Rock Charger. It's a 1-3 flyer for three. That when it attacks, it gives another attacking creature of yours flying. All right, okay, obviously, it's not a top-shelf EDH card. However, in a less competitive, punchy meta game, if you have a commander that uh, wants to get through for commander damage but doesn't have built-in evasion on its own, yeah, I could see a corner case deck where you might want to run Rock Charger. That's why it's the 99th best card for commander. Number 98, I have Swift Blade Vindicator. Obviously, this thing needs buffs. A 1-1 in a 40-life four-player format's not going to get there very far. However, in an equipment deck, in an aura deck, this is a pretty good start in terms of keywords on a mana-efficient creature to uh, maybe getting in for some early serious uh, ahead-of-curve damage. Number 97, I have Guild Summit. Uh, Wizards, uh, this is going to be a theme as we keep going through this. Wizards seem to be pushing uh, gates, specifically in EDH, in Commander. Um, the best way to win with gates, I think, is Maze's End. That's why it's on the screen right there. I don't know. If you're trying to build some sort of Maze's End, Turbo Fog, win by alt win condition, uh, sort of deck, Guild Summit seems decent. If, if your mana base is going to be fixed because of gates, might as well have a Guild Summit in there to... Uh, it's it's pretty efficient card draw if your mana base is heavily gate dependent. Uh, more on that later. Number ninety six. I have True Fire Captain. Uh, kind of a pseudo similar. It reminds me of Boros Reckoner. I've been tempted the whole time I've been playing Commander to try to come up with some sort of a brew that uses Boros Reckoner and gives it indestructible, and then you cast some big damage spell like a Blasphemous Act, and maybe Strionic Resonate that to double it to deal damage right to an opponent's face. And having a True Fire Captain out there. Um, you know, it doesn't do anything to discourage me from wanting to make that Boros deck happen. I haven't made it happen yet, but it's an idea I've always had in True Fire Captain. Uh, kind of like another copy, less good, but still good copy of Boros Reckoner. Nullhide Ferox, I think I'm saying that right. Mainly in here because of its last discard ability. If an opponent makes you discard this card, instead you can put it in play. Like Obviously you don't want it in decks that run a lot of non-creature spells because that tax of two mana to turn that off will start to add up. And just like a vanilla 6-6, I mean yes it does have hexproof, but that I think matters more in other constructed formats where it's two players and 20 life instead of four players, 40 life. Uh, anyway, I don't think that... It's in an EDH game, most people are going to want to waste a removal spell on just a vanilla 6-6. Six, six, unless it's crashing in for lethal or something. But I digress. Hexproof, not that big of an upside. Not casting on creature spells. Pretty big downside. But being able to drop this into play for free when an opponent thinks they're going to make you discard a card. It's a cute play. It's a cool play. I like it. It's in here for that reason. Could, could go into some stompier decks. But aside from that, I, I probably wouldn't run it. But I like the card because it's unique. Um, at 94... A card that Snoop Dogg named, true story, that's not a true story, Hypothesizzle. Five mana to draw two cards. You can discard a non-land to have it deal four damage. Like, it would be a lot better if it was at four CMC instead of five. But four damage is enough to start dealing with some of the more serious threats in EDH, in Commander. Like, you can kind of think of it as a double cycle. It cycles itself and then it cycles another non-land card in your hand and uh you know you get four damage on something yeah I, I don't know it's probably not quite efficient enough for higher competitive tier commander decks but if you're talking about like a 75 percent or lower meta game absolutely hypothesis has a cool name it does a cool thing um blood operative i wrote it's a nickel and dime style card if you have some surveil synergy in there and if you're in a meta game where a lot of people are trying to take advantage of things in their graveyard if you can cast it, get some value, gain some life, let it die, get it back, cast it again, exile another threat from an opponent's graveyard, it, it can really start to add up. Although, it's kind of a specific situation we're talking about. But in that specific situation, very good. You can get some value out of this. Although, you know, three power is not going to be enough to uh, get there, as it were, in a 40-life four-player format. Um, but the lifelink can help you stick around long enough to maybe get there. So it might be worth including in a handful of decks. Swarm Guild Mage I have at number 92. Uh, like all Guild Mages, it is a little bit slow because uh, unless, you know, you have a way to give it haste, uh, going to take a turn cycle 
level of your opponents knowing full well what you might be wanting to do with it before you get a chance to do that. But uh, it's first ability, giving plus one, plus O, oh, and menace until end of turn to your whole team. If you're in a token deck that's trying to spew like 1-1 one, one tokens, it effectively doubles the power of your team while having the number of blockers your opponents have, right? By granting menace, they have to dedicate two blockers to every one creature, which means that you could probably get in an alpha strike. You could probably swing for lethal after firing off that first ability. Second ability, eh, probably not very relevant uh, most times. But uh, yeah, Swarm Guild Mage, number 92. Feel confident with that. Uh, number 91, Disinformation Campaign. It's perfectly playable just by itself, even without surveil synergy if you're in like a 75% more casual meta. Uh, and if you can add some surveil synergy in there and bounce this to your hand and cast it again and bounce it to your hand and cast it again, like by the time you do that two or three times, that's pretty backbreaking. That's a pretty big swing if all of your opponents have discarded three and you've drawn three. That that adds up uh, pretty quickly. If you can do it five times, six times, that um, might be enough to even win you the game. So I, I do like this card. Number 90. <laughs> Keeping it simple as a burglar rat. It's a thieving rat. When it enters the battlefield, all opponents discard a card, which is kind of the inverse of you drawing a card. So it's not quite card disadvantage. I don't like it quite as much as cards that say when it enters the battlefield, draw a card, because that's more of a sure thing. Like, if you're in a late-game scenario and some opponent has, like, 15 cards in hand, discarding one isn't going to be that big of a deal. But conversely, if you do this early on and your deck is, you know, maybe more of a reanimator strategy, if you tend to play better in a situation where people um, are closer to top decking, uh, then I think Burglar Rat is perfectly viable. I wouldn't overlook this, um, yeah, especially if you can cast it, sack it, reanimate it, sack it, reanimate it, sack it, right, and call that a Ferris wheel of death that's what i call that anyway and the burglar rat loves to ride on the ferris wheel of death muse drake <laughs> uh, simple it's a simple card i was just saying i like cards that replace themselves but it, it blocks it can pick up a sword and start swinging in it does not reduce your hand size it does cost you a little bit of tempo four mana is maybe more tempo than you'd want to spare at a higher competitive tier of commander but you know again at a 75 percent meta especially if you're trying to play the politics of the board, play the politics of the pod. Uh, if you're the person spending four mana on some dinky flyer, you're probably not going to leap out to your opponents as the first primary threat if this is how you're spending your early game and your mid game. And uh, that can enable you to kind of fly under the radar a little bit, stay alive because you have a blocker. All else being equal, people are going to swing at someone else. Uh, you know, the, the, these sort of cards, they're very simple, but it's not, it's not bad. Like, I really like creatures that can trip. You don't need to be too fancy with things. Uh, number 88 here, I have Pilfering Imp. Like, if your plan is only to activate this once, probably not worth it in Commander. I think Thought Seize type effects, Duress style effects, just are, are, are proportionately worse in multiplayer as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one, because it, you kind of have to divide the number of cards you're getting in terms of advantage by the number of opponents you have uh, when you are not drawing. So it's kind of one-third as good as Thoughtseize would be in just one-on-one -on -one magic, right? But if, you know, see I have Marin of Clan Neltoth on the screen here, you have a way to get this on a Ferris Wheel of Death and activate it multiple times, targeting probably the same opponent that you're most concerned about in the pod, you know, two or three activations in the early to mid game can really put a stick in their spokes and help you leapfrog ahead of someone who, you know, otherwise uh, might be the arch enemy going into the late game. Uh, next up at number 87, whoopsie doozy, uh, we have Night Veil Sprite. One, two flyer for two that when it attacks lets you surveil one. Uh, like if you can do this multiple times, if you can get it surveil trigger multiple times, around about the third or fourth time you do it is probably where you've gotten more than you put into this uh, mana wise. Like it's a small enough threat that opponents aren't going to want to, you know, dedicate a removal spell to getting rid of it. But if you can thin out your deck and filter your draws turn after turn after turn eventually you know that, that can start to have a pretty big effect on your agency within a pod of commander number 86 you got to see this for half a second a minute ago i have league guild mage again guild mages are kind of slow right if you don't have a way to give it haste then uh, your opponents are going to know that you have the ability to you know use them next turn but at the same time they, they tend to fly under the radar not quite a big enough threat to be dealt with usually although they can be caught as collateral damage in board wipes blah 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 the top ability 
is fine, four mana, tap, draw a card, but it's the bottom ability that really excites me in conjunction with cheap instants and sorceries in blue and red. I have Impulse featured, I have Pongify featured. I mean, you can probably think of a dozen more off the top of your head that would also be really cheap to clone and really great when cloned. So yeah, that, that could be a bonkers ability. Um, you know, at two mana, you, you, you can start doubling your instants and sorceries pretty early in the game. Uh, at number 85, I have Capture Sphere. Blue sometimes is a little hard-pressed for dealing with threats when they have left the stack, right? Blue is great at dealing with almost any threat at all by countering it, but if you, for some reason, tap out and can't counter some threat in a pinch capture sphere, uh, you know, four, four converted mana cost is a little bit spendy as you get up into higher competitive tiers, but if I'm, you know, helping someone deck build, looking through a deck in a 75-80% sort of meta, uh, I'm almost never going to tell them to cut a removal spell. Even kind of mediocre removal spells are better than, you know, a lot of flashier creatures often uh, when it comes to commander. So, yeah. And, and also, you know, tapping the creature down rather than trying to destroy it, it does dodge certain things like indestructible. You know, you can tap down an Eldrazi where, you know, murder wouldn't work. Uh, so, you know, uh, Capture Sphere, I, I wouldn't throw away every copy of Capture Sphere you open in draft. It's not total draft chef IMO. Uh, at number 84, I have Inescapable Blaze. Red is also a little bit hard-pressed for removal. Uh, six converted mana cost is obviously very, very high, but being able to hit opponents' faces in the late game with this uh, can be very relevant, and the fact that it, it can't be countered, I mean, by the time you're dedicating six mana for a removal spell, I don't know if your opponent in a lot of cases would want to counter it in the first place because that's already a pretty big tempo setback, but th that can be relevant. You know, an uncounterable removal spell that could also, I mean, there are moments where players are, you know, hanging out with five life. Uh, this could just end their game right then and there and dramatically increase your chances of winning the pot. Uh, you know, I, I like it, you know, uh, in, a, in a mono red deck. I think if you start dipping into other colors, you probably have better options for uh, control suite. But six mana, you know, it's, it's something. You can get there. Uh, number 83, I have Erratic Cyclops. In a spell slinger combat based metagame, this is a viable way to get in for big damage. You know, by the mid game, it's only four converted mana cost. Um, not a whole lot else to say. Like, it is obviously vulnerable to removal. It dies to Doomblade, as people like to say. But, uh, you know, for four mana, this can have very high power pretty quickly in the right kind of shell. So, number 83. I think that's that's fine. District Guide is number 82. It is strictly better than Borderland Ranger in so fact as you can fetch up a gate. I don't know that I consider Borderland Ranger playable in metagames past like, you know, the 70, maybe 68% mark in terms of, you know, competitive tier, but District Guide is a little bit better because you know, even if you're not going for that mazes and turbo fog thing I was talking about earlier and will continue to talk about through this video, uh, being able to fetch up a gate in a deck with, you know, three or more colors is, you know, money-wise a cheap way to fix your mana uh, pretty reliably. So, yeah, higher competitive tiers, you probably want to be, like, straight up ramping for three mana staple to a creature, like rather than putting it in your hand, putting it onto the battlefield. But, you know, 75% you know, decks, uh, I think this is perfectly viable if you really need to fix your mana. Uh, Book Devourer is number 81. It needs haste. That's why I have anger on the screen there. But if you can cast it and swing with it and cycle through your hand, I mean, give it double strike. That's why Fire Shrieker is there. And you can uh, activate its ability twice. It's a May, so you don't have to if in the first strike damage you like the hand that you get from there. Uh, you know, the, the drawback is that if your hand is already pretty small, which in red sometimes, unfortunately, is the case, uh, then it's just a 4-5, an, an, an inefficient 4-5 an inefficient trampler. Uh, but, you know, if, if you have ways to keep your hand full and you're really digging for some sort of, I don't know, combo piece or synergy piece, Book Devourer uh, can get you through it, get you through your deck pretty fast. And uh, there's some fun tricks. It's a fun card. I like this card. I want to shoehorn it in to more decks than maybe uh, it is smart to. <laughs> uh, spicy if you give it double strike. I wrote down spicy. Anyway, number 80. I have Devious Cover-Up. You know, this, this begs a question. How good is a bad counterspell? Normally, four mana is more than you want to be spending on a counterspell. But it's still a counterspell. And uh, I think it's better than the cards I have featured 
so far. Also of note, in a long, grindy matchup, reshuffling four key cards into your deck, eventually you might draw into one of them again, and it might be the difference between winning and losing. I don't think that ability is irrelevant. And the fact that it exiles whatever spell it's countering, that is often relevant in Commander. So, you know, four mana, you, you can probably find enough three mana counter spells that you don't need to run this, but it is still a counter spell. I am never going to tell someone that they should cut a counter spell from their deck. Uh, assuming that we're not, like, really on the level talking about 90th percentile or higher of competitive tiers of Commander decks. Anyway, Beam Splitter Mage, s number 79. Uh, it, it obviously requires some build-around, but I am... I, I, not only am I, a, am I a Zada Hedron Grinder player, but I met Mark Rosewater once, and the card I had him sign was Zada. Just because, I don't know, it's whimsical, it's weird. I feel like Mark Rosewater is a whimsical, weird guy. Uh, so anyway, I have a signed by Mark Rosewater copy of Zada. And Beam Splitter kind of sort of does what Zada does, but is also in blue, obviously. So the other card, just as an example of a way to take advantage of this, is Cerulean Wisps. Target Beam Splitter, draw a card. You can target maybe, I don't know, a, a, a creature that untaps a permanent or something, and then draw an extra card off of that. So you're drawing two cards for one mana off the Cerulean Wisps. Uh, it, it, yeah, build around ability, but I ha I have a soft spot for this ability that copies spells that only target a single creature. So, uh, number 79. Number 78, I have <laughs> the uh, the double ass card. A a ass sure and ass emble. Uh, <laughs> I, I think Assure is a lot better. Uh, it just protects your most important creature, maybe puts a counter on it. I could see that going in maybe an Atraxa deck where you really want to get that first counter on her before she begins proliferating. Um, but Assemble, you know, it's not bad. Instant speed to put six power on board can, you know, sometimes be pseudo-removal if someone's swinging in thinking they have a an open board, but instead uh, you suddenly have three things to block with. Neither of these on their own are that good, but the thing about these split cards is they give you so much utility. You can cast one side or the other side, and that utility, I think, makes up the difference. And I, I like it at number 78 here. Number 77, have another split card, Find Finality. Uh, you know, Find is very straightforward. Return two creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. You can sit back and use that if that's ever a, a good value play, which, you know, in the right decks it often will be. Or, in the right situation, Finality, um, I suppose, could be a blowout. It's a little hard for me to analyze here, uh, just because you're making a creature bigger, but then making all creatures smaller, but only by four. I think it's going to vary wildly from board state to board state just how dynamic Finality is. But the fact that it's stapled to Find, and you have the choice between the two... I, I feel confident ranking it at number 77. You know, this is this is perfectly playable. Perfectly playable EDH card for maybe more stompy decks. Number 76, Molder Hulk. At its best, this card is hot fire. Two converted mana cost, if you have a fully stocked graveyard, for a 6-6 body that ramps when it enters. That is crazy. If you can get to that in, like, the mid-game somehow... Big, big, big play. Uh, at its worst, it's in your opening hand before you've had any chance to fill your graveyard. Uh, and, you know, you have some opportunity cost there. So you have to weigh that uh, when considering whether or not to run this. But I, I like it a lot. This card absolutely will have moments where uh, it feels like you're playing hot fire. Hot fire there. Number 75, Flower and Flourish. Flower helps prevent the need for mulligans. Uh, if it's in your opening hand, but it's a two-land hand, well, it's kind of a three-land hand because turn one, you can drop that flower. Or, you know, it can be a finisher in a token deck. I probably wouldn't want to run this outside of a token deck because flower on its own, uh, you, you'd probably rather just run, I mean, Wayfair's Bobble jumps to mind as being probably strictly better because it ramps you rather than putting the land in your hand. Uh, but in, in a token deck with the ability to cast Flourish for the win, this card's really strong because early game it's good because of flower, late game it's good because of Flourish, the utility of it being a split card uh, very strong. In a token deck, I like this a lot. And any deck with kind of a go-wide strategy, which tends tends to be token decks, let's be honest. Uh, Golgari Raiders is at number 74, and the word that makes this card as good as it is is, as is often the case, haste, right? If you clear the board, then drop this. You can probably punch someone for lethal, right? If we're mid to late game, right? And you have a pretty stocked graveyard. Seems plausible in certain decks, certain board states. Drop this, punch in for lethal after casting some sort of board wipe. Love it. Um, this is Bacon Bolt, number 73. Uh, kind of weird that they'd include just like 
pictures of bacon on it. No, I'm just kidding. This, I'm, this is my card altering skills. This is the first card I've ever tried to alter. It's, it's actually called Beacon Bolt, but I, it's pretty obviously Bacon Bolt, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a good card. It's two removal spells in one. The downside is that in the early game, you maybe haven't had a chance to sling enough instant and sorcery spells for it to be like a removal of all the threats you need it to be. But by the time you get to the mid game or late game, if you're in a spell slinger shell, it's really strong. It is two removal spells in one card. I mean, you basically have to discard maybe a land card later to jumpstart this thing. But uh, yeah, in a slingy deck, this gets there quick. Bacon Bolt. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think of my card altering skills. Uh, number 72, I have Golgari Find Broker. It, you, you're no eternal witness, Golgari Find Broker, but you do replace yourself immediately when you enter the battlefield. In some cases, you're like a slightly worse, maybe substantially worse copy of Eternal Witness, but that's a high bar. Any card that draws comparisons to Eternal Witness is at least worth considering playing in a lot of decks. For CMC is a lot. There are cheaper ways to return uh, cards from your graveyard to your hand, um, but the fact that it's a creature body means that you can maybe recur it. Put this on a Ferris Wheel of Death, similarly to how you might with an Eternal Witness. Yeah, it's good. Set number 72. Another number 72. It, it deserves that. Number 71, I have Join Shields. Uh, it's, it's a unique card. You can use this card in lots of different disparate situations. It protects your team. It sets up board wipes. It can you know result in your team being surprise blockers. Lots of very cool tactical lines that uh, are really kind of skill testing. Uh, running cards like this, I mean, it's 5 CMC, which is a little bit high, but the versatility makes up for that in metagames up to, you know, probably the 80th percentile of competitive play. Uh, so, you know, I, I like it. You know, cards like this um, reward experienced players and smart, tight play. Uh, number 70, I have Aurelia, Exemplar of Justice. She's a strong mid-range commander she can get in early for damage and kind of grind out a bigger and bigger team like she, she probably wouldn't be my first choice for a commander in boros and she's probably stronger in like standard than uh in edh and in commander just because 40 life four players that's a lot and i prefer if i'm gonna be punching in with evasive creatures to try to win with damage i prefer for those creatures to be bigger than four power five power you're probably closer to six or seven each but uh, aurelia can get in early and start grinding uh, up some extra value i'm sure there are ways to take advantage of her um you know i i would not take for granted uh, my safety in a pod where someone is revealed that their commander is about to be Aurelia. So, uh, getting to number 69, Ral. Is it Voight Vicero? Is it though? Is it really Ral? Uh, <laughs> if you can get three activations of Ral, uh, you have more than covered the mana cost. I, I'm, I'm a little bit bearish on Planeswalkers in Commander generally. I think they're better in one-on-one, -on -one, 20 life formats. I, I think all else being equal, uh, players will often make the political calculation to swing at a planeswalker on the board rather than someone's life total because that tends to scare people less so planeswalkers often aren't long for the world in edh in commander but if you can protect him if you can get you know three or more activations off of him um I think that you, know, you will have ground out enough value to make up for uh, the mana cost. Yeah, Ral can definitely grind. Number 68. I have Knight of Autumn. It's mainly about that uh, middle enter the battlefield choice where you can nuke an artifact or enchantment and call that a naturalize effect. It, it's just an efficiently costed way to have that removal effect that also gives you a blocker and can maybe be recurred in some sort of a graveyard strategy or brought back with an eternal witness. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good card. It's a good utility card, but mainly you're going to be using uh, that middle mode to nuke an artifact or enchantment. At number 67, I have Light of the Legion. Uh, this can just be part of the get there package, right, for a mono white deck. If you're trying to win with damage in a Battlecruiser metagame uh, in a mono white white deck you know has five power it can make your smaller creatures larger it makes your whole board bigger it it, it fits kind of weirdly into a deck that has a half tall half wide strategy and often i'll give advice not to build decks like that uh, my advice is often just like pick one you're either going wide or you're going tall go all in linear in that direction this is you know kind of a, in in the middle of the road between them but um perfectly playable number 67 
I'm happy with it there. Number 66, have Runaway Steam Kin. This just screams like Storm Deck, Combo Deck. If you're slinging red spells over and over, you can get free mana off of this. Like, I'm envisioning some game ending turn where this is in play and is part of how you have enough mana to just be like burr, 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 for whatever sort of win that uh, you're going for but even if you're not using this in some enormously explosive turn where you use the activation multiple times uh, in the same turn uh, it's also a way to just grind out pseudo ramp in red you know even if it just sits there gets a counter one turn a counter next turn a counter the next turn and the turn after that you have three more mana you're three mana ahead of curve which uh, is totally fine red you know is hard pressed for ways to do that so uh, number 65 I have quasi duplicate this, uh, this set has a lot of challenges for pronouncing card names here and there. Quasi-duplicate. Um, <laughs> I've always been tempted, similar to my Boros Reckoner Brew idea, uh, to try to make a deck that wins with Bio-Visionary. And Quasi-Duplicate certainly could come close to getting you there. You need one more way to copy the bio visionary but because it wins at end step means that there's not a whole lot of time for your opponents to try to deal with whatever you're doing quasi duplicate lets you get two copies of it for just six mana although i guess nine mana if you're casting the uh, bio visionary that same turn but anyway we're we're in corner case territory here we're just talking about my specific brew ideas i'm um, also worth pointing out this goes infinite with dual caster mage as is the case for any instant or sorcery that creates a copy of a creature right if quasi duplicate is on the stack cast du dual caster mage Mage, copy it dual caster mage um, is in the battlefield already on the battlefield already and you can make another copy and another copy you just get infinite dual caster mages um, so uh, yeah it's, it's, it's a cool card I like this card a little bit fragile but it, it can go infinite uh, yeah the dual caster mage combo I should say is a little bit fragile uh, just because unless you have a way to grant haste you can't swing right then and there but uh, yeah again again number 64 deafening Clarion, uh, pretty straightforward card. You'll wipe out the little creatures and then swing in for an enormous life point swing, right? Get rid of all their blockers, maintain your board of like four toughness or higher creatures, and then punch someone for 20 while you gain 20. It's going to be hard for them to come back from that. Sorcery speed, not quite as good as if it was an instant, obviously, but still very good. Number 63, um, Radical Idea. You can kind of think of this card as having cycling, and then granting cycling to any other card in your hand at any point for just two mana. Um, you know, it, it's not a super explosive card draw effect. It's basically just replacing itself and then allowing another card to replace itself. But it, it makes your deck thinner in a way. You know, the same reason that even though you're allowed to run more than 40 cards in a limited deck, you almost never want to just so that your deck is proportionately better cards. Uh, you know, radical idea any sort of cheap blue cantripy draw effect uh, effectively makes your deck smaller for a very low tempo commitment. Uh, any competitive tier deck like 85% uh, or below probably benefits from just uh, slinging, slinging, slinging spells like that. So yeah, like Radical Idea. Number 62, I have Vivid Revival. Three cards for five mana is a great ratio, returning them to your hand from your graveyard. Um, I have included Restock on the screen just to prove that point. Normally it's two cards for five mana, but the fact that they have to be multicolored is a big drawback. It's not going to fit into every deck that runs green, obviously. No mono green decks are going to run this at all, but uh, Ramos Dragon Engine is a commander near and dear to my heart that uh, jumps to mind as a great fit for Vivid Revival. So yeah, uh, number 62 seems strong. Number 61, I have Etrata the Silencer. Uh, this card took me a while to like read and understand and wrap my brain around. Uh, sh she's really good, especially as part of the 99 uh, without trying to win off of her. I mean, regardless of the fact that like an opponent might lose the game from her ability, just being able to exile a creature uh, is very strong. If you want to run Etrata as your commander, you, you need a way, I think, to get around the last sentence of that big trigger uh, where you shuffle her into uh, her owner's library. Deadeye Navigator would be a great way to dodge that. I, I, I think I, my understanding of how this works um, is correct. If they are soul bonded to each other, you swing in. Uh, that trigger goes on the stack. In response to it, you blink her out with Deadeye. She comes back in. She's a new game object. That trigger will still resolve, but it won't be thinking of 
her as the same her that she was when the trigger went on the stack, right? Because she left and came back. Uh, so you would not be required her to shuffle her into the deck then, and then you could pretty quickly get in for three swings to knock a problem opponent out of the game. Also managing their board, it can be pretty devastating. But because that, that's so specific, such a super build around, it has to, has to be in that very specific situation. Maybe there are other cards that could do it. Um, I mean, there, there are other cards that are one-time use blink effects, absolutely. Although in blue-black, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Leave a comment below if you do know a card that might also work off the top of your head. But uh, yeah, that increasing her commander text. Because you would redirect her being shuffled into the library to just putting her in the command zone, right? But uh, even then, she goes up two in cost. And that probably becomes too much of a tax to uh, want to try to do it that way. All game, every game, right? Dead Eye Navigator. Very important. At number 60. There we go. I have Impervious Great Worm. Is <laughs> real big. Is real resilient. You can cast it for very cheap. I mean, you're not going to see it in combo metagames very often. But if combat is the norm, where you play magic w with the people that you play commander with, then, uh, you know, sometimes Timmy just wins. Right? This is a Timmy card, but uh, it's a Timmy card. You know what I'm saying? We're going to go to 59 now. Omnispell Adept. It's a little bit slow, and your opponents are definitely going to see this as being a threat. So, uh, you know, the peanut butter jelly combination here is Omnispell Adept plus some kind of shoes to give it protection and give it haste to get that value right away. Um, yeah, yeah. Lightning Greaves, Swiftfoot Boots solve the biggest problems with this card. If, if your deck is not running Greaves or Boots, because not every deck should. Sometimes you don't need to protect your commander. If you don't also need to protect your commander in the same way, I probably wouldn't recommend running Omnispell Adept. But if you do, and that's a lot of decks that do, uh, Omnispell Adept, perfectly viable, perfectly great. Yeah, five mana plus three mana is eight mana, which you could probably just cast the instant or sorcery for that much anyway. But if you can use that ability twice or more for spells that cost, you know, five or more, it starts to be really, really worth it. Um, and I think I think that also lets you cast sorcery spells at instant speed, right? I'm not wrong about that, am I? Do timing restrictions still apply? I don't think so. I think that that ability is instant speed, which means you can cast that sorcery anytime you want. So that little added upside too, maybe cast a board wipe during someone else's turn. Number 58, electrostatic field. This is in the very sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone of being annoying enough to matter but not quite a big enough threat for your opponents to want to dedicate a removal spell to it until they just need to, until they're at like 15 life and starting to sweat too much uh, from this. It's a brand new friend for gutter snipe, any sort of deck that's trying to win this way. Perforos, God of the Forge, also comes to mind as uh, somewhat similar. Yeah, Electrostatic Field, two mana, hard to argue with that cost. Number 57, uh, Murmuring Mystic, also a trigger every time you cast an instant or a sorcery spell. A new friend to Talrand, Sky Summoner. They can uh, bond over their mutual love of birds of varying sizes. Uh, <laughs> I, I can see a permission control deck that runs just every counter spell under the sun featuring both of these cards that would be very annoying. Very annoying to not be able to play anything ever and very annoying to know that you have lost to a big old flock of birds. <laughs> All right, number 56. I have Necrotic Wound. I had a hard time analyzing this card, figuring out where exactly to put it on the countdown because obviously if your graveyard is stocked for one mana to remove any threat, even dodging indestructible at instant speed, that's really good. That's like tragic slip level good. Um, but if you don't have that setup, if it's the early game or if someone bajuka bogged you, then it can be a dead card. So I, I have it kind of middle of the pack here. Uh, you know, your, your yard is not always stocked. Sometimes it's a dud, but uh, when it's good, it can be real good. Uh, going to number 55, have connive and concoct. Uh, both modes are strong, kind of mid rangey effects. The first one is pseudo control, gaining control of an opponent's threat and making it your own is better than control, right? Uh, and, and having options, right, between these two, like I've been saying for all the split cards, means that, you know, you just have extra utility. You have more opportunities to out play your opponents by sitting back and waiting for the perfect time to cast whichever mode of this happens to be perfect, right? These split cards, I think, reward experience and they reward, um, and they, they are very skill testing cards. They reward um, dynamic, smart play. And that's fun. At number 54, um, I have Discovery and Dispersal. Discovery 
it, it reminds me of any sort of top-notch blue cantrip effect. The only uh, downside is that it costs probably one colorless more than uh, you know a, a great blue like Serum Visions type card uh, normally costs. But that's because you have the option of casting either Discovery or Dispersal. Dispersal, in a weird way, reminds me of Crackling Doom. That's why it's on the screen there often. The biggest threats are the permanents that cost the most mana. Go figure. And so in the same way that Crackling Doom, even though you don't get to choose exactly what it's targeting, it almost always hits what you'd want to target anyway. Uh, Dispersal, same situation. Uh, It can be a big, big play. Um, uh, (laughs) The more opponents you have, the bigger a play it is. That can be a big tempo play. Number 53, Hatchery Spider. I, I want to point out, I did not realize this until I read this card for like the third or fourth time. The undergrowth on Hatchery Spider is a cast trigger, okay? It's going to be very, very hard for your opponents to prevent you from getting that trigger. They'd have to like exile your graveyard in response to it uh, because countering this spell does not counter the undergrowth trigger. You are going to get that permanent. And by the time you have the seven mana it would require to cast this in a deck that runs this, hopefully you've been able to fill your graveyard um, with enough cards that uh, you're going to get some value off of it. So Hatchery Spider, I can definitely see some big plays. It's not quite, uh, what do you call it, Genesis Wave, but, uh, you know, uh, 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 getting a single big threat and digging a little deep to get there uh, can be cool. And even if it's only for four or something, you can still get uh, some grindy value and have a big blocker there in the form of a spider. Number 52, Chance for glory. Uh, A little plug for some of my other content. Uh, I have a series that uh, I just started called Wombo Storm, and the very first episode is called Final Fortune Tribal. This is basically the same effect that Final Fortune has, except it also gives your creatures indestructible, which uh, in Commander EDH is is kind of the the, the less interesting half of this. I mean, normally an instant speed effect that gives your whole team indestructible is really strong, but unless you're entirely confident you're going to win in the extra turn that it grants you, uh, you, you wouldn't want to use it to just protect your team from a board wipe because you will you will lose the game. It says the words, you will lose the game right on there. But uh, anyway, in that episode of Wombo Storm, I talk about all sorts of ways to try to break this exact effect. Uh, I'm definitely going <laughs> to go in and update that deck list and include this. Uh, nothing but an extra copy of Final Fortune. If you use effects like Sundial of the Infinite or any way to um, you know counter a, a, a triggered ability or just end the turn early, you can dodge the lose the game trigger. And even if you don't want to go that route, if you're in a combo deck or a deck that's just about to be able to swing for lethal, probably go wide damage, I think would be the the case for most decks that want to run this. Um, it, it can be a super explosive and memorable, fun play. Your, your opponents are going to shake their heads in disbelief and shake your hands in uh, respect if you can win off of a chance for glory. So definitely a build around. Uh, the shenanigans around it are pretty specific, but uh, I, I like this card a lot. Number 52, you know, it, it's not the best commander card in the set, but it, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Number 51, I have Thief of Sanity, which is just a strictly more playable version of Night Vale Spectre. You can dig three with it. You can play cards uh, with any colored mana, not just, you know, Night Vale Spectre doesn't allow you to spend mana as though it's any color. Uh, Even when the thief is gone, you're able to cast those spells, unlike Night Vale Spectre, where it needs to stick around. Otherwise, you lose the ability to play those cards because it's text that's, like, written right on the Night Vale Spectre as opposed to text that's part of the trigger ability. Really long triggered abilities in this set sometimes. Uh, yeah, it, Thief of Sanity is kind of in the sweet spot of having a potentially big effect on the game, but without looking like a big enough threat to merit dedicating a removal spell to it before you get an activation off of it. Most of the time, most of the time. So number 51, like it. Number 50, very simple card, Crush Contraband, uh, Exile and Enchantment, and Exile and Artifact. In a four-player game of Commander, you're almost always going to have targets for both at Exiles rather than puts them in the graveyard. That's better. This is good. I don't need to spend too much time talking about this. You understand. Number 49, have a Goblin Crater Maker. I think usually you're going to use this to blow up artifacts. Most artifacts are colorless. Uh, and the fact that it's on a creature body means that uh, it can be reanimated, repeated. Um, Alicia is one commander who smiles upon this card, smiles at this card, if you will. Number 48, Bounty Agent also could go in an Alicia deck. Um, similar story here. It nukes a problem commander. 
and then you can reanimate it and repeat it. Maybe not quite as good in Alicia just because it'll enter tapped and attacking, which normally is not an issue because of vigilance here. But uh, I digress. You're still, still very good to be able to nuke your opponent's commanders and maybe do it again. Two mana, hard to argue with that cost. 47, I have Tristani Discordant. I, I, I just like the idea of having an anthem effect in the command zone of uh, go wide token strategy. I mean, the token enter the battlefield effect is also relevant here. Uh, and, and the last ability, I think that's mostly just upside. But for a token build in green white, I think this is a very strong option as a commander. I'm a little less certain about it in the 99, uh, but you, you could still use it in the 99 to great effect, of course, but I like it most in the command zone. I think this is pretty good. Uh, number 46 have the, uh, what is it? This is the this is the card. This is the card they're using for all of the marketing materials for this set. Uh, you know, I've, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Planeswalkers tend to be better in you know other constructed formats just because all else being equal, players will swing at the planeswalker rather than the player because that's a safer political choice. Doesn't put as much of a retributive target on your head. But uh, the ultimate on Vraska is. Very, very exciting, although even if you have a doubling season in play, it still requires two turns um, before you can activate it. But if you can, you can probably win the game. Not that hard to get through with any amount of damage on any creature at any point. <laughs> uh, and, and even the first two abilities are very strong. You can grind out value turn after turn, uh, even if you're not trying to go for the uh, crazy players lose the game anytime you deal damage to them emblem but uh, yeah Vraska yeah, number 46 um, would be higher if this was a show about standard or modern or but uh, it's about commander number 45 I have Tajik Legion's Edge initially I had Tajik way 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 back uh, like a long time ago in this countdown because I, I misunderstood or I didn't fully grasp just how good the prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to other creatures you control block of text right there if Tajik is your commander then you could build the whole deck around that ability, basically running as many board wipes as possible that are damage-based, right? Starstorm, Chain Reaction. Run those cards, build out a big board, wipe your opponent's boards, and the damage to your creatures will be prevented because of Tajik. If you give Tajik indestructible, that would be even better because it does say other creatures, so Tajik would still die. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that could be a really spicy commander build in a combat metagame number 44 i have fire mines research it, it takes some time to be able to grind out value from this card but in a spell slinger deck stop me if you've heard that before this could be pretty good it seems like spell slinger is getting a lot a lot of support in the guilds of ravnica um, if you play this on turn two you're gonna get value off of it throughout the entire game opponents are not going to see fit to get rid of it because you do have to dedicate you know mana and tempo but uh, yeah, it, it, it'll get there. It'll get there. Uh, if you draw it late game, you might be a little upset that uh, it wasn't something else. You know, you might rather have a counter spell on turn 12. But um, number 43, I have Chemister's Insight. Four mana for two cards is not amazing, but the ability to jumpstart this, you know, to cast it again, pushes the card uh, into maybe more competitive metagames than it, it would see play in otherwise. You know, probably not great for decks past, like, the 80th percentile in terms of, like, competitive tier on the 75% scale. But for a majority of commander decks, this is super solid. Drawing cards, never a bad thing to do. Sometimes dedicating four mana to drawing two cards is not the best way to spend your tempo. But, but, but in most decks, I think it would be pretty good. Number 42, ultimate answer... To life, the universe, and everything, we have circuitous route. Circuitous root route. How do you how do you pronounce that word? Root or route? Leave a comment below. Probably route, but then how do you pronounce R O U T with no e at the end? Anyway, what are we talking about? Strictly better than explosive vegetation, or as I like to call it, boom boom broccoli. You can pick up your foil copy of Maze's End right now. I'd recommend it. You heard it here first. They are pushing gates and this is a gate. Well, it's actually not a gate but it's relevant to gates and it's a way to just win the game. It has the words win the game on it. So pick up your foil copy of it now. It's a mythic. It was printed in a set that was the third in a block. Wasn't opened all that much. Probably pretty cheap pickup. I actually don't know how much it costs right now but Maze's Zen is probably going to go up in price because they're supporting gate strategies. Like, there are going to be a lot of people trying to run Maze's Zen Turbo Fog stuff. Oh, they might reprint it. I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're not going to redo Dragon's Maze, are they? I hope not. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Circuitous Road. Yeah, yeah, it's just a better explosive vegetation. Uh, allows you to fix your mana um, better than just searching for basics. You can search for gates, and you don't care because they're entering tapped anyway. Uh, so, yeah, pretty good. Like, I mean, I don't know how many decks 
in practice are actually going to switch their mana base to be gate focused but they're gonna you're gonna see more gates in commander pods in the coming year than you've seen in the last couple of years because they're being pushed a little right now number 41 i have ritual of soot destroys all creatures cmc3 or less like it clears out the dorks if you're running a deck that doesn't have any dorks or that doesn't mind your dorks dying like a reanimator strategy maybe Marin of clan neltoth uh this this seems perfectly good you know it's a great x41 removal spell it, it misses some of the biggest threats that might be out there but uh we'll we'll get to that a little later in the countdown number 40 i have amara soul of the accord i love commanders with low converted mana costs to cmc seems pretty great if you drop this on turn two you can almost always rest assured that you're going to be able to swing with it at least two or three times at an opponent who doesn't even have a blocker yet uh, and get some free lifelinky token value, which can be a head start into a board where maybe you have a Phyrexian altar and can sack those creatures for extra mana or some sort of an earthcraft and tap them to untap your basics and start getting out of hand there pretty quick. So yeah, Amara, I think very strong token commander dawn of hope number 39 it's a mana sink that's able to spam tokens i mean four mana maybe it's putting it strongly saying you're spamming tokens at that point but you can create tokens and ultimately those life linky creatures will cause the life gain trigger for you so it does in a roundabout way eventually replace itself and if you're in a life gain shell already it can replace itself many 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 times over i think that almost any life gain deck is going to want to run dawn of hope have it at 39 I think that's a good place for it. At 38, we have March of the Multitudes. I see this card setting up uh, potentially winning turns. I mean, like the, the most obvious line is cast this for a big X cost, uh, the end step before your turn, then on your turn, drop a Crater Hoof Behemoth and, you know, go to game two. Game two, anyone have an answer? Anyone have a counter spell? Huh? Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty straightforward. X cost token spammer that uh, is at instant speed. Pretty good. Number 37, this, this is uh, maybe one of my personal favorite cards of the set. It really caters to my specific play style. I love it. Uh, it's an efficient, evasive threat for a control shell, if you're running a lot of instants and sorceries, that replaces itself when it enters the battlefield. Like, if you're in a metagame that is not combo-based, uh, this is an efficient way to start getting in for a lot of damage without reducing your hand size. I, I like, like, like this card a lot, a lot, a lot. Number 36, another uh, split card. We have Response and Resurgent. Five damage with Response there is enough to deal with a lot of threats. And uh, Resurgence, on the other hand, uh, is, you know, an extra combat step that's often enough to at least knock out one opponent. Hard to argue with that if you have the creatures on board to back it up. The fact that you have access to both in the same card uh, means that it's excellent utility. Um, makes this card very playable. Like it a lot. Number 35, we have Izoni Thousand-Eyed. This is this is a prime speaker Zagana for the Golgari. It's the same mana cost. Like I'm, I'm seeing some parallels here in what they're trying to do. Um, by the time you're casting something for six mana, you should have a pretty stocked graveyard. Then you spam tokens with this. It is a sack outlet. It enables you to draw cards. It's a little bit of a Swiss army knife of a legendary creature, uh, which makes it really, really strong. 35, I think that's good. I think you're going to see a few commander decks with uh, her at the helm coming up pretty soon. Number 34, it's a little weird trying to figure out where exactly to rank a land just because it's so different than, you know, trying to analyze a card with a mana cost. Like, mana cost versus what you get for it is, you know, how you analyze commander cards mostly. But if it's a land, it's like it doesn't cost any mana. You just get one for free. It's nothing but upside on a land. I, uh, I put a Traxa here. I mean, okay, you might not want it in a Traxa deck insofar as it's four colors and this. I mean, it does help you fix your mana, I guess, but it also sets you back a turn on the curve but the reason i mentioned atraxa she's the most popular commander the last i checked uh and the most important plus one plus one counter for her is the first one once you have one on her then her proliferate ability allows you to just make her a scarier scarier threat turn after turn so being able to do that with a land without having dedicate having to dedicate you know a, a non-land deck slot to add encounters to her or to other creatures that you uh, might want to run in her um Seems pretty good. You know, get that first counter off to the races. Attracts is also relevant in other decks, obviously, but Attracts is just the best, biggest example that comes to mind. Number 33, have Dream Eater. This, this card does a whole heck of a lot, uh, and it does it very 
suddenly, very quickly. No one element of this card is crazy backbreaking, but in aggregate, it can be a very big play. Like, pic picture this for me. Someone swings in with a creature that has an equipment or an aura on it. You flash this in, bounce the equipment or aura back to their hand, block the creature to kill it, and also surveil four. And maybe Dream Eater survives. Probably not in that situation, but still, that's a, that's a big play. That's a lot of uh, agency that you have just used on the board in one card, right? And you're setting up your draws with the surveil ability, not to mention setting up your graveyard if you're doing graveyard stuff. Very, very good. Dream Eater, I like a lot. Number 32, Plague Crafter. It's a strictly better version of Merciless Executioner and Fleshbag Marauder. And uh, discarding, you know, they, 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 they've fixed those cards in a way by not allowing any opponents to get around them by just not having any creatures. The, the control player no longer gets off scot-free from Merciless Executioner or Fleshbag Marauder with the Plague Crafter. Like, I, I would argue that discarding a card is usually worse than sacrificing a creature, unless you only have one creature and it's a really big, scary creature that you dedicated a lot of mana to getting on the board. But uh, yeah, Plague Crafter, you're going to see a lot of Plague Crafter coming up in the next year. Number 31, Conclave Tribunal. It hits any permanent, and if you have enough creatures, you can cast it for free. You just tap those creatures, right? I, I think it's, it's not strictly better than Banishing Light, but in a lot of decks, in practice, it is strictly better than Banishing Light, which is already a staple. Conclave Tribunal, going to see that card a lot. You're going to see the rest of the cards in the countdown probably a lot, uh, proportionate to how much commander you play. In the coming months, Divine Visitation number 30. This is a house in token decks as long as uh, you're trying to spam 1-1 one, one tokens. Like if you're spamming 2-2 two, two, or 3-3 three, three tokens, making them 4-4s, four, like it is better. Like it still might be worth 5 mana in an enchantment to get that out there. But if you're spamming 1-1s, one, you're quadrupling their power, you're giving them evasion, and you're allowing them to block after they attack. If you combine this with things like Anointed Procession, and I mean Elspeth is just a great way to spam tokens, you know, just, just, you know, if, if you have all three of the cards on the screen right now in play and you use Elspeth, you're not getting three one ones. You're getting six four fours. <laughs> pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, number 29. Maybe. Maybe it's going to go. Oh, let's see. Oh, if I press this again, though, it's probably going to go twice. There we go. Number 29. Justice Strike. I mean, very simple, but this card alone goes a long way towards making what is arguably, in my opinion, the worst color combination, but worst two color combination, uh, red, white, a lot more playable. Like one of the problems is it just doesn't have access to that much great removal. I guess it kind of does like good creature removal um, in the form of swords and path and chaos warp. But you know, having one more is not bad. Uh, th th this, this goes a long way towards making a lot of Boros decks just that much more playable. Uh, it's a big boon for them. Um, not, not a whole lot else to say. It's just it's just pretty good. If the toughness is higher than the power on a creature, it might be a problem. But that's it's kind of rare. It's kind of rare. Like, you, you'll see some creatures, but normally the problem creatures have very high power. Those are the ones you're the most afraid of. Normally. Number 28, I have Notion Rain. I don't know if it's better or worse than Read the Bones. It's just kind of a different a, a additional copy of Read the Bones. Read the Bones is already a very widely played card uh, up until your pretty high competitive tiers uh, because it digs you four into your library for just three mana while drawing you two cards. Like dig digging four deep for a effect that draws two and only costs three. And th those are a lot of numbers I'm throwing at you, but that is... That is great value. And so if you also have some sort of a graveyard strategy that, you know, that makes the surveil extra relevant, uh, I, I think Notion Rain, you're going to see a lot of it in decks that are in blue and black, which is not every deck, obviously, but <laughs> debatably the two best colors. Green is also one of the best, you know, the best colors in Commander are green, black, blue. Fight me. Leave a comment below. I dare you. Disagree with that. Ha ha ha. The mob will disagree with you. That may not be. Number 27. <laughs> What do I do? All right. All right. I've been, I've been yakking a long time. I'm starting to lose my mind. Number 27, I have Mausoleum Secrets. This card's a little difficult to assess just because, you know, only searching for black cards does limit its scope and the decks that can play it. But the fact that it's an instant means that, you know, in certain situations, in certain decks, this is just a, a better demonic tutor. Like if you're in a mono black deck with a lot of creatures in your yard, this is a strictly better demonic tutor. But the flip side of that is 
if you're in more than just mono black, probably not worth running. Or you know, if you're if you're in three or more colors at least, I don't know. I, I mean, you, I guess you could always use this to search up the demonic tutor at instant speed. Yeah, it's good. Don't it's good. It's a very good card. Like what I mean when I say I have a hard time analyzing it is, I, you know, I'm not sure if this should be marked as like one of the top five cards in the set because some of the most competitive decks in the world will probably see fit to run this if they're like very black heavy, like ad nauseum CEDH decks, you know, might see fit to run this. But, uh, you know, I, as, as someone trying to speak to all commander players of all competitive tiers, you know, th this feels about right. Number 27, you know, it's, it, it's a good card. It's a very good card, but it, it fits into a narrow sliver of decks. Uh, not sliver decks, though. Oh, God. Oh, man. I've been talking too long. I've been, I'm, I'm losing my mind. I am losing my dang mind, YouTube. Number 26, I have Underrealm Lich. The longer this bad boy sits out there on the battlefield replacing your draws, letting you look at three cards and choosing one and putting the others in your graveyard, setting up whatever graveyard shenanigans you're doing, the better, the more value you will have gotten. Five CMC in a deck that also runs green. Not uncommon to see you cast this turn three, turn four. The fact you can pay for life to keep it indestructible, keep it around, means that you're going to be filtering your draws all dang game long. This this is a house. This is a good, good card. I like it a lot. And look at that type line. Zombie Elf Shaman. That's cool. Zombie Elf Shaman. Has there ever been a Zombie Elf Shaman before? I don't know. I'm going to go with no. But if there has, leave a comment below and let me know. <laughs> Number 25, I have status and statue. This is mainly about statue here. I mean, status is a neat little combat trick. If you've got a creature with first strike, or just like some dinky creature you don't care about and someone's crashing in with some big thing thinking that they can just like make you block and kill one of your creatures. Ha ha, joke's on you. It has death touch and your creature dies too. But, but statue is the real news here. It's not quite as good as utter end, uh, but destroying an artifact, a creature, or an enchantment, you know, that... Probably 80% of the threats you're going to run into in Commander are going to be, you know, one of those three categories. So it's it's like a it's like a slightly worse Utter End that is maybe as good, if not better, than Utter End just because it also has status stapled to it. And that utility, even though, you know, 90% of the time you're still going to use it as statue, you know, that 10% of the time that you're able to get value off of status uh, maybe pushes this card ahead of utter end i mean what leave a leave a comment below let me know what you think which is better statue status or utter end haha <laughs> ho, ho number 24 invert and invent it's a kind of similar card to status statue uh insofar as it's like a dinky little combat trick on the left and a big blowout effect on the right like this one even more so i think you're almost always going to want to be casting invent but the fact that you're tutoring for two cards at instant speed in blue, presumably with counterspell backup, means that if you cast Invent on the end step of the turn before yours, during your you, you could you'll probably just be able to win, right? Find some sorcery that's like a combo piece or just a big blowout, and find an instant that's either a counterspell to back it up, or if you already have a counterspell in hand, then just like another weird combo piece instant thing. I don't know. There's just a lot, a lot, a lot of ways that Invent I think can be a setup play for winning the game outright this is a number 24 i think that's a really really strong card number 23 gruesome menagerie uh i have buried alive pictured on the screen also i think for obvious reasons pretty often in the next year you're gonna see people casting a buried alive and then casting a gruesome menagerie and saying do, do i win does anyone have a counter spell mm -hmm. uh, normally i advise people not to counter the tutor but if that tutor is buried alive you know like wait until they're actually casting what they tutor for but if the tutor is buried alive just count buried alive is good it's a amazing edh card it's an uncommon but it could be a mythic goodness yeah the, these are the sort of plays that make counter spells so darn good counter spells are really good <laughs> number 22 have camaraderie you know if you're playing a green deck six converted mana cost is not that high an asking price for an effect that's this explosive if you have any sort of go wide deck that's spamming tokens just runs a lot of like cheap value creatures paying six mana to draw five plus cards maybe 10 plus cards maybe 20 plus cards you know gaining that much life and giving a little anthem effect like the anthem i think usually is probably just upside although it could be the difference between uh, you know an alpha strike or just you know chipping in for damage that turn yeah it is, it is you're gonna see the, a lot of this card in green white decks 
if you're uh, if you play against a lot of people who play a lot of tokens who like to go wide. This card, very very good. Number twenty one, Risk Factor. This is a controversial placement for this card. I think this is maybe. Uh, uh, maybe the most surprising card this high in my ranking that you've seen so far. It's n I don't think it's that good in Constructed. Maybe it is. I don't know, because four damage matters a whole heck of a lot more when you're in a 20-life format. But the reason I think this is so good is, first of all, red is very hard-pressed for card draw, obviously. Uh, and in a multiplayer format, right, 75% of the time, on average, you are not going to be in first place. Someone else is going to be in first place, and sometimes they're going to be in first place by a lot. We've all been in commander games where you're effectively playing Arch Enemy because someone, you know, had Soul Ring Mana Crypt in their opening hand and is just, like, off to the races way too fast. In those situations, because you get to choose which opponent you target, and, and this is at instant speed, you know, if you have six mana up and step before your turn, someone's the arch enemy, target someone who's not the arch enemy, they're going to let you draw those cards because you're going to be saying to them, I might draw an answer. I might draw a way to wipe their board to deal with. I might draw my Blasphemous Act, right? Risk factor for six mana in red very often will be drawing you six cards. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I like it a lot. I like, oh, It's so good. Red, red needs stuff like that. They're given red some great commander cards to help it hold court with uh, other colors like, say, I don't know, blue. Number 20, Midnight Reaper. It's not quite Grim Hera specs because you lose life uh, and also can't, like, morph it in. Although I don't know how often people are really morphing their Grim Hera specs. Anyway, anyway. But it's a like a second copy of Grim Hera specs, which is already, you know, EDH staple in certain decks, in reanimator decks, where you're trying to get a Ferris wheel of death going on, casting a creature, sacking that creature, reanimating that creature, sacking it, reanimating it, sacking it, setting it to the graveyard and back. And it's just like basically twice as good as Harvester of Souls, except that it pings you for one every time, but that's probably not that in a 40 life format usually doesn't i mean it can it can add up I, there have definitely been games where that has mattered uh for me but yeah harvester at half the price number 19 citywide bust I, I hinted at this earlier when we were looking at the uh the black version of this it destroys um cards with converted mana costs three or less this destroys all creatures with toughness four or greater and i think this is better in commander because normally the biggest threats are the biggest threats <laughs> uh, also you can build your deck um, around kind of a weenie strategy this would slot right in to an alicia who smiles at death deck for example another commander i'm very partial to uh yeah i mean it's yeah three mana i mean that's the cost that you would pay for a targeted removal spell the fact that this is a massive x for one that maybe leaves you as the only person with relevant creatures uh very 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 strong definitely expect to see this in go wide strategy decks number 18 sinister sabotage it's just a strictly better cancel they, they i mean they've already printed many strictly better cancels but cancel is a perfectly playable card in commander in fact it's a great card in commander which makes this a a, a greater -er card and the same tier as Dissolve, debatably better than Dissolve, if you're trying to do anything at all with your graveyard. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is going to join the ranks of blue decks all the way up until, you know, at least the 95th percentile of competitive commander. It's very, 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 very good. I'm definitely going to try to pick up a bunch of copies. It's an uncommon. It shouldn't be too crazy expensive, although yeah, I'm sure it will see play in standard, so it might it might cost a couple bucks until it rotates out. But uh, Price of Fame is number 17, uh, kind of comparable to... Are we talking about the Sinister Sabotage there? Uh, it is a murder for commanders at Doomblade prices with a surveil upside. That is crazy good if you're destroying someone's commander or just a legendary creature that they have and even if you're not even if you're using a removal spell that costs four mana like there are cheaper ways to remove creatures but the utility of you know being able to cast it for two at a legendary or cast it for four at any old creature plus surveil two like that's still not bad like not bad at all perfectly reasonable cost number 16 is mission briefing this card is whatever you need it to be like it's not quite snapcaster mage all right but what is that's a very high bar okay the fact that i'm drawing a comparison means that this one is very good it can be an extra counter spell in a pinch if you need it to be it can be another recurring insight if you need to refill your hand or would just like to fill your hand with lots of extra extra cards i mean it can be all sorts of things this is a great utility card the only situation where it's bad is never
<laughs> Maybe not never, but <laughs> number 15, Beast Whisperer. Like, okay, I want to talk about Primordial Sage. Primordial Sage sees a lot of play in Commander, and it's not because of its 4-5 body, all right? It's because it draws you cards every time you cast a creature, but it costs 6 mana. Beast Whisperer costs 4 mana, which means that, like, board-building creature-based stompy decks are going to get a lot scarier. This is a scary, scary card to have sticking around for a while. I mean, worst case, it eats a removal spell or a counter spell from an opponent, likely me. I will likely be trying to counter your way to draw card after card after card, uh, but is really good. <laughs> like, we're, we're, we're getting into elite tier EDH cards. Number 14, we have Expansion and Explosion. If nothing else, Expansion is like a counter spell for counter spells for most of them. I mean, I don't think people are running many counter spells that cost more than four mana. And that gets more and more relevant the higher and higher of a competitive tier of commander that we're talking about. Okay. And explosion is go figure an explosive play. Right? For one more mana than a Sphinx's Revelation, instead of gaining you life, it's like a removal spell. Or maybe, you know, it's not uncommon for players to be sitting around it, you know, 10 or less life. If you have 15 or more mana, you can, you know, <laughs> wipe out that player and refill your hand with a whole heck of a lot of cards. Like, this, yeah, Expansion Explosion is nuts. This is bonkers good. Like, prob I, f I forget if there are other split cards further down in the countdown. I don't think, I think this is the best split card in the format. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I forget. I, I, I put this together very quickly. <laughs> the spoiler just went live yesterday. So number 13, I have Niv, Mizzet, Perrin. Almost everyone who plays Commander relies on instants and sorceries or at least casts them from time to time. Like the worst case scenario with this because it cannot be countered is that you know even if it immediately eats a removal spell, He's, he's still replacing himself, right? You're still drawing a card off of that removal spell as long as it's not like a creature with flash, which is, we're, in, we're talking about corner case territory right there. Like, it's a crazy draw engine that has a Tim upside if it sticks around. It's going to be a very, very popular commander and a very, very scary commander. niv it ex expect him. Expect him when you go play EDH uh, a couple weeks from now. Uh, numbers 8 through 12, don't need to dedicate... Individual slides to these are the lockets. Any deck that uh, is in you know these colors up to probably like the 85th percentile of like competitive commander is probably going to want to run these uh, just because like it's a totally fair cost for a ramp effect, especially if you're not in green and late game. If you already have oodles and oodles of mana, you know four mana is not. Uh, too spendy to draw two cards as the upside of something that has been ramping you all game before that. There's just a lot of value packed into these lockets. Um, they're among my personal favorite new cards uh, in Guilds of Ravnica. I will definitely be running these in many, many, many of my decks, um, as long as three doesn't seem like too much uh, for a, a ramp effect, which I think is the case for, again, competitive tier up to probably the 85th percentile. Uh, number seven. Lazav the Multifarious. I, uh, I was having a real hard time evaluating Lazav because, uh, well, okay, I, I, I googled Lazav CEDH and I found a thread on r slash CEDH saying that this will in fact be useful uh, and see play in 100% decks, in the most competitive commander decks that are out there uh, because it can become a necrotic ooze. It can become another copy of your laboratory maniac. There are just a lot of ways that you can, I don't know, make infinite mana and blink this infinite times to dump your graveyard or dump, dump your library into your graveyard and then make this anything you need it to be and like win out right there. And a lot of the common like stack C effects that competitive EDH decks run to rein in other decks that are common up at that high competitive tier like apparently this is a way to get around a lot of that like I'm I'm not a super expert on like the cutting edge of CEDH uh, but I dabble a little bit and I could definitely see where this um, is crazy I don't know if they would want it as the commander um, I mean it's in good colors you know blue black obviously a lot of tutors a lot of counters uh, and a, a commander that costs two uh, pretty cheap you can get it out there even if it's dealt with can recast it again at some point um, Weirdly enough, I think that the lower in the competitive tiers you go, as you get closer and closer to, like, combat-based metagames, I think this gets 
worse and worse. Um, I, I don't know how much good this is going to do for you in a 75% meta where, you know, people are trying to win by swinging with big dragons. Like at that point you're spending two to then spend like seven to make it a dragon. And like, I don't know if it's worth the tempo that you've poured into it, but uh, anyway, like, Many of the most competitive commander players um, are going to see fit to do all sorts of shenanigans with Lazav. Number six. Go. Come on. All right. Uh, let's press it again. All right. Hey, there it goes. All right. Doom Whisperer. This is not ad nauseum. Okay. But the fact that I have to say that means that it's real good because ad nauseum is crazy. Ad nauseum, another staple of the highest tier of competitive commander decks. Um, you know, enabling you to just pay 30 life to dump 30 cards into your graveyard and any sort of graveyard strategy is very, very, very strong. And even uh, unlike Lazav, I think this stays just as good, maybe even better uh, in lower tier competitive decks um, because it's a 6-6 six, six flying trample for 5 that allows you to filter draws. It's a life sink if... Uh, somehow that becomes relevant um just you you, you don't want to be mind slavered while you control this and have an even <laughs> amount of life because then you can just lose the game but that's yeah, a corner case doom whisperer yeah real good card very excited about all sorts of shenanigans with doom whisperer number five getting to it now thousand year storm there are about a million maybe a thousand ways <laughs> that's not that's not even a joke dan there are about a million ways to break this card wide open i mean six converted mana cost is not nothing but if this resolves and survives like if you have nine mana and can back it up with a counter spell and protect it for a turn cycle like you it it's going to probably end the game the the most obvious the first thing that jumped to mind was time warp right cast pongify rapid hybridization brainstorm then time warp Okay, goodness, you get like five turns, four turns, five turns. Yeah, five turns in a row, including that turn, right? Uh, yeah, if it resolves, it's going to... And Stroke of Genius, right? If you spend like one man on a cheap spell, one man on a cheap spell, and then eight man on a Stroke of Genius, suddenly you're drawing, what's that? It's like 24 cards. Crazy, crazy. Well, maybe not quite 24 because you subtract three from that. But 15 cards, whatever. What you, you understand. Number four, Mnemonic Betrayal. Not quite Yawgmoth's will, but the fact that I have to say that means this card is pretty darn good. The reason it's not quite Yawgmoth's will is because you have no control over what decks your opponents, or what, what cards your opponents are running in their decks before you sit down to play with them. So it's going to be better in certain pods than others, but in certain pods, it's going to be... I mean, if it doesn't outright win the game for you, it's almost always going to result in some crazy value line that vaults you into first place and can likely propel you to victory in the ensuing turns so uh yeah mnemonic betrayal i'm i'm excited to play this card i'm excited to see what this card can do absolutely positively number three is ionize this this one might be a kind of surprising pick uh to put up this high but a hard counter spell it counters anything with no drawback and it only needs one blue mana that, that, that is the whole reason this card is good. It only requires one blue mana for a hard counter spell with no drawback. In fact, it has an upside. It deals two damage. Like, that's not that relevant in Commander, but, it, it, I mean, it can become relevant. There are certainly games that are decided by, you know, two points of life. Uh, because, okay, all right, the, the higher up in competitive tiers of Commander you go, um, you, I mean, often people will ask, how much mana do you have up? But equally common past like the 85th percentile of competitive commander is how much blue mana do you have up right the difference between this being one blue requiring one blue mana and requiring two blue mana will often be the difference between you being able to hold up one counter spell and you being able to hold up two counter spells and the difference between one counter spell and two counter spells can be the difference between winning and losing uh, during critical turns when there's a critical stack going on with multiple blue mages trying to control who gets to do what that that can be the difference ionize is really good like deceptively good it is not just another cancel it is like it, oh yeah mm, mm. Very excited. Okay, number two is Assassin's Trophy. This should come as no surprise to anybody. Uh, it's just, it, I mean, everyone, I am not the first person to tell you that this card is good. This card is obviously good. And I think it's disproportionately good in Commander even because the drawback, right? Your opponent gets to search 
for uh, a land and put it into play. Uh, that's not as big of a drawback proportionately in a format that's likely to live to, you know, people are going to live to see turn 10, 11. I mean, at least in lower competitive tiers, higher competitive tiers, you know, I guess people will normally combo off turn five or six, if not sooner. Um, but right in, in most games of commander, the drawback here is less than the drawback would be in standard or modern or legacy or vintage. And I, I, th I believe, again, I'm not an expert on any other format, but I believe this is going to see play in basically every format. And it might be the best in Commander. Uh, 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 just uh, If it's not mm, over $50, because everyone is going to want like four copies of this in other formats, and even Commander players are going to want one copy each, uh, if it's not 50 bucks, you're going to see a whole lot of it. It's probably, it's probably going to be a twenty dollar card at least till it rotates out of standard. I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert on the price of Magic cards either, but you know I know some some basic things. Anyway, 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 this is number two, which leaves a very big question: what what could possibly be number one? Dan, what is the number one card, new card for Commander in the Guilds of Ravnica? Well, I'm glad I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you're curious. Please, can we get? Can you, I my hands are occupied here, so if you could do the drum roll for me. On the on the desk or whatever, yeah, wherever you are, just on your legs, uh, you know, yeah, okay, all right, all right, here we are. Number one card is oh, oh. generous stray. Ah, oh, oh, value, oh, value city. Oh, I need some water. I've been yakking for like an hour. Mm. Mm. That's good water. Uh, maybe it's just that I recently got a cat and have changed her litter enough times that the toxoplasmosis has invaded my brain, but this card, I would be on the lookout for uh, banning. Uh, too good. It's too good. It draws you a card when it enters. One, two, body. It's only three mana, and two of that mana can be of any color. Okay, it's a common, which means people are going to be opening it left and right. Expect the cats to invade your Medicaid. Ex expect us. Expect them. Them. Expect I'm not a cat. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not turning into a cat slowly because of the toxoplasmosis in my cat's poop when I change its litter. If you don't know what toxoplasmosis is, you should Google it. It's fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Cats are fascinating. Ah. Mmm. Generous. Ah, oh, it's, it's so cute. It's, look, look, look at that. Not only is it game-breaking, but it's adorable. I'm Dan Brown. And I will be next week, although I don't know if I'm going to... I actually, I'm at a wedding next week. I don't know if I'm going to make another video, but two weeks from now, I'll still be Dan Brown, and I'll be right back here making Commander content for y'all. I'll probably make some this week. I don't know. I don't want to make promises. I don't know that I can keep, but uh, yeah, yeah, cats are great. I'll see you later. Call your mother. <laughs>